Hello, and welcome to another episode of the B2B Leadership Podcast. My name is Nils Vinya, and today my guest is Ken Wong. Ken, welcome to the show. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to digging into all things leadership with you, Ken. But first, would you tell us a little bit about your role today in the company that you're working for? Sure. So I'm the uh, founder and director of Social Wave. So we're a demand generation agency that focuses on brand building um, and also making people subject matter experts um, to help generate leads and grow their revenue. Awesome. And I cannot wait until we get to the second part of this conversation because we're going to be talking about how to apply some of those um, principles and tools and things that you use to help people build demand from a leadership perspective. And there's going to be some interesting things. So, but first, you've got some, you know, incredible background in what you've gone through in your career. And I want to explore that a little bit. And then we're going to shift gears. And then we're going to talk about the second piece, which is all about how to, you know, essentially build demand for your leadership, either within your organization or even outside of it. So, Ken, uh, would you share a little bit about how you got into your first leadership position with us? Sure. I, uh, I came from a strange background. Before the agency, I was actually, uh, I did about a decade in hotel management. Um, so the first uh, leadership position I ever did was actually just as a uh, front desk duty manager, as they call it down here. So you were basically um, the, the shift supervisor. Uh, you ran the show in the hotel in the absence of everyone else. Uh, and because hotel, you know, are 24 hour operations, a lot of the time in the evenings, um, you know, once senior management has gone home, you're sort of the, the one taking care of it, uh, everything, you know, you're the main point of contact. So that was my first gig. I was, I think, just out of university. I was uh, 22 years old. And um, yeah, that was my first gig. Wow, fantastic. And you spent 10 years in the hotel industry. Now that was, that was a significant amount of time. And did you stick with the front desk thing for long or did you explore some other avenues? What, what really fit the bill for you? Yeah, a bit of everything. I, uh, I, I tend to have itchy feet once I get a little too comfortable. I'm, I'm always sort of looking for something different. Um, where I started was in front desk, but then eventually because of my degree, I did events management. Uh, I moved into events coordination um, and sales. So transferred over to the conference and sales team, um, did that for uh, three or four years. Uh, and then before I sort of got sick of it and just, you know, hospitality is one of those industries that can be a bit cutthroat and can be quite difficult to work in if you don't have the right team. Decided to go back into front office and then, you know, did a bit more sales, a bit more marketing, um, and, and then eventually moved into more executive management. Wow. So across the board there, is, would love to hear about the themes from a leadership perspective that enabled you to be successful in all those different disciplines. Like while it's all related to hospitality, you have front desk, which is one set of skills. You got events management, which is another set of skills. You got more executive management, which is a completely different set of skills. So how did you navigate all those different areas over the course of your 10 years in hotels? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I think it's um, it's multifaceted. Um, I think the best managers out there, in my experience, and just sort of drawing inspiration from them, has a lot to do with, you know, them being, you know, the, the modern day polymath from a management experience perspective. Um, and what I mean by that is you sort of have to be relatively good at a multitude of things. You can't just be specialized in one thing. Mm -hmm. um, the other half of that is, you know, EQ, um, emotional intelligence, I think. You know, as a leader, you need to be very in tune with your team members, your staff, understanding what it is that makes them tick. Um, that's what drives a lot of sort of the uh, the great managers because um, I, I drew a lot from that where they, you know, help motivate. They understand, you know, when you're having good days and your bad days, they can pick that out um, and they can really sort of get the best out of you. Um, and that's generally what I found. And then obviously, you know, in terms of how I've been able to explore um, that from a, you know, growth perspective and, you know, moving into multiple roles and very dynamic different roles. I think it was mainly about sort of having that level of curiosity, um, very much so being very driven um, and, and, you know, getting the results you wanted. And I think just the intention of doing good work. I think a lot of people fixate on, they have one eye on the job and the other eye on sort of what's ahead. And I very much so just focused on, look, that's, that's my job ahead of me. Just focus on getting the work done and do it really well and just do the reps. It's like going to the gym, you know, you're not going to get a six pack um, on the first day of the gym, um, you're going to need to do this consistently day in, day out before you get really good at it. I did. I know it's a wonderful analogy and I definitely support that hundred percent along with the importance of EQ. So in your role, let's just take the events management space. Um, how big of a deal was EQ when you were dealing with some of the types of clients and some of the environments that you were in when you were managing somebody's actual live event? 
Yeah, massively. I mean, clients are, you know, they're very stressed on the day of the event, particularly the ones who've never done it before. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to spend a lot of time, you know, making them feel comfortable. Um, so that EQ is highly important, but also for your team, you know, um, hospitality, just by the nature of the industry and the type of talent it attracts generally, um, you get a very dynamic, um, you know, people from all walks of life. Um, and those personalities can sometimes be very challenging, right? I mean, um, dealing with, say, chefs in the kitchen are very different to dealing with your um, food and beverage attendants to maybe even the food and beverage manager. Um, so you sort of have to understand what makes them tick and what you have to say in order to get what you want. And a lot of that time um, could be whether it's, I don't know, stroking egos. It could be just about, you know, framing things the right way um, just because it's a very heated, high-pressure environment. So you've just got to be really careful about, you know, understanding where they all come from, whether it's right or wrong. I mean, um, you know, and I don't think this is unique to hospitality, but I think, you know, um, employees can sometimes be too me centric, you know, it's the world revolves yeah. around them, um, yeah. and then what's important to them. So sort of also playing to that, um, a little bit tends to, to help really well. I, uh, I always say to my team here at, um, social wave, it's, uh, you sort of want to sell people the dream, you know, what it is that they want to do. They, they want to buy a house, they want to retire, they want to, mm -hmm. I don't know, live on an Island, whatever it is you know, you, you sort of sell them a dream. You go, look, I'm here to help you get there, you know, no matter what that is. And, and how do we get there? Let's talk about that. Let's work together towards that. Yeah. And oftentimes people don't lead with their dream, right? You got to ask some questions. You got to build some rapport. You got to demonstrate some EQ for them to be comfortable enough sharing their dream with you. Cause sharing right. the dream is sometimes a very, very personal thing, especially in, you know, in, whether you're in the hospitality industry or any other profession as a leader, um, every single person that you come in contact with, whether it's on your team in your organization, client, they all have a dream, right? And you're never going to know what that dream is until you earn the right for them to share that with you. And that's I right. I think that goes down to company culture as well. Um, having a safe environment, an environment for, um, your employees to say what they feel. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of massive on transparency, um, and, and also massive on just, you know, open door policy. I know that sounds a little bit cliche, but, you know, literally having your door open all the time. Um, and then also just being out in the trenches with your team members as well. I think a lot of leaders send, tend to, you know, sit in their proverbial, you know, ivory tower and they don't come out. Um, I know certainly when I was in hotels, you know, on front desk, it was like if the desk got busy, you'd be out there, you know, helping people with customer service. Um, you know, working in events was the same thing. It was like, my job was in sales. I was there to just bring in the business and then there was a team to coordinate. But if the going got tough or they needed all hands on deck, you were out there clearing plates. Mm. You were out there, you know, you were the kitchen hand basically. So it's that sort of, um, respect that you earn through, you know, your actions as opposed to what you say, um, tends to perform much better. And then you create an environment or a culture that allows you to be able to have these conversations with these guys and understand what truly motivates them. That's wonderful. Yeah. You got to earn the right. And those are some great examples of how you've done that. So let's talk about social wave right now. Now this social wave and is a demand gen agency, as you told us. However, um, why don't you tell us about how this got started? Cause it was, when you shared this with me, I was kind of taken aback. I was, I was a little surprised to be completely honest. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I quit hotels after about, you know, 10 years. I, uh, I took a gap year and, you know, basically when traveling, um, it's, it's a very common here in Australia. Um, you sort of take it. I was, I was, I was almost a mature age gap year person. You know, you usually do this after you either finish high school or university. So went traveling, always loved traveling. Um, went with my partner and we just sort of went around Europe and Asia. And during that time I was doing some, um, marketing consulting and freelancing, um, with, um, some, some, you know, friends and contacts of mine who own companies. And they just said, look, you're, you know, you got some time, you probably want to earn some money as well. Why don't you um, do some marketing for me? I said, I should, sure. I, you know, got no idea about, you know, I know very little. I've done some marketing for hotels, but that's about it. Anyway, so this was, uh, this was from April, 2019, right until March, 2020. And as most people know, March, 2020 was when the world changed and the pandemic hit. So here in Australia, the borders shut. Um, and so it was time for me to come home, even though we reluctantly didn't really want to. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> And so came home and um, it was either two options. It was either to go back to an industry that was completely, you know, um, decimated by COVID, you know, there was no travel on the cards or to really assess and figure out what it is I wanted to do. And it was at that point um, where, you know, we had, you know, doing marketing for some of these businesses, we'd gotten massive results. Um, and, and some of our clients had, you know, hundreds of leads, inbound leads every single month through um, video marketing, you know, demand gen, brand awareness, all that sort of stuff. And so, um, I'm not sure if it was just a lucky break, you know, I'm sure I think luck definitely has played a part in business, but um, we picked up, you know, probably two or three other additional clients during this process. 
and ultimately that led to sort of starting up the business and so the business was set up you know in march 2020 and now we're sort of what january or february now um at time of recording 2022 so close to you know a bit over 18 months and um it's gone from zero to seven figures we've got a team of you know 22 um staff and and part of that is i think just really just off the back of you know um good work creates great uh, you know more great work um and, and that's where the business is at now today wow that is i mean you know more i've heard lots of stats i don't have the exact source but more wealth is created in economic downturns usually than the upturns and the pandemic was a great example of that right the whole reason behind a large part of the business that i run on the leadership development and coaching side is exactly the product of the pandemic your entire seven figure business didn't exist two years ago right and here you are with a team of 22 serving clients all over the world which is absolutely wonderful so Take us through some of the more salient leadership lessons that you had. You had worked in an industry that was very established. There was lots of structure, I imagine, in most of these roles because they'd been done for a long time in the hospitality industry. So, Ken, I'm sure there was a number of leadership lessons that you've learned in scaling your business from zero to seven figures in 18 months. Would you mind walking us through some of those salient points that are things that you absolutely 100% had to do to build a team and a culture and a company that you really wanted to? Yeah, look, I think there's a lot of overlap between, you know, building a big team or not building, I mean, just running a big team in hotels. Um, you know, at, at the time, you know, I was running an immediate team of 30 to 40 team members um, that would extend out to 200, 300 if you thought about, <clears throat> you know, who, who I actually had to oversee, you know, as a eventually rooms division manager so you had like housekeeping um you had concierge you had front desk you had a range of different other um team members and so um you know that compared to a team of now 20 um is, is very different um I'm, I'm so used to the fact that i'm dealing with big teams um i guess the the benefit of that is just really understanding you know we're, we're a service-based business and so we're sort of tethered by the time um and the productivity of our team members that's been the biggest you know i guess challenge with um I guess, growing this agency or scaling this agency, which is how do you get the most out of them? Because you have, you end up hitting a cap at some stage with each individual team member. Um, so that requires a lot of, I guess, ongoing training. A lot of our team members are fairly young. Um, I'm sort of a big proponent of hiring someone who um, is a little bit more fresher, but has the right attitude. You can always mold them into, you know, what it is um, that, that you feel like they would benefit most from. And so um, generally speaking for us, we spend a lot of internal um, training time and, and resources towards that. I, I think, in fact, we've got in a couple of hours going to be doing a, a training session on productivity and efficiency within the company as well. So I, I think that, um, you know, both from a selfishly from a profitability standpoint, um, you know, provides a lot of benefits, but certainly I think also from a, a stress and a culture perspective as well. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, outside of that, I think... Um, very much so. I, I'm sort of the main um, point of contact when it comes to sales and lead generation in the company as well. So as a leader, you know, um, you know, being on podcasts like yourself, um, and and also you know we've got um, you know our, our business coach James Schramko, who we know of, um, and platforms like that to be able to sort of be in front of different audiences. Um, a lot of that comes from demonstrating leadership, subject matter expertise. You know, pretty much practicing what I preach, which is you know really just being a contributor when it comes to you know what it is that your target audience or market needs to know about. And then in turn, as the company grows and, you know, you're not worrying about keeping the lights on, um, which is what we worried about at the start of the, um, the pandemic, um, it, we, had the, we have the luxury now to be able to sort of invest a bit more. And uh, we actually, in fact, hire our own, long overdue, our own internal marketer as well, who's going to be doing a lot more marketing for ourselves. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And yeah, you mentioned James there. So James is our mutual coach. That was how we originally got connected. Uh, and it's been wonderful to get to know you and, and see your journey um, on the social wave side and learn from all the experiences that you've had and just like others get to learn from my experiences and when we share that on our various calls. So let's, there's a good, really good segue um, into taking your marketing and leadership expertise and now talking about how we could enable leaders listening to this podcast with some tools, some ideas, some thoughts on how to effectively market their leadership. And this is an area that I find oftentimes very lacking from a leadership perspective. And the assumption is simply that, well, if I do the job as a leader, that's enough. And I'm here to tell you that it's not, number one. Um, and sometimes people just don't know exactly what it, what does it even mean to market your leadership? So I would love to take your expertise and kind of 
translated into some things that we could give our audience here to start thinking about whether you're going to build your brand internally at your organization, whether you're going to build it externally on LinkedIn, whether you're going to do it all. Where should people initially start as they're kind of thinking about, well, maybe I need to do a better job of marketing myself as a leader? Mm. I, as someone who's in marketing, you sort of see a lot of content being created, you know, which is, you know, the main form of, um, I guess, demonstrating your, your expertise or your leadership <laughs> in this case. Now, there are a lot of people out there creating content, but there's, to be quite frank, not a lot of great content. And so I think it starts with positioning and differentiation first, understanding what it is that you have to say, why is it different to the market? Um, I like to sort of teach my clients a, a case of sort of understanding what movement-based marketing is, which is to say, you know, here's where, how things are done currently and here's where things are moving towards and here's what you need to do in between that time in order to get you there, right? Um, for marketing, that could be the market, the attention shifting towards tools like TikTok, you know, um, short form content. You know, you need to start creating content there because if you don't, you're going to be left behind, right? Mm -hmm. Facebook wasn't what it was 12 years ago. Instagram's on its way out as well in terms of organic reach. You know, LinkedIn's still fantastic probably for another two or three years. And now you've got everyone moving towards, you know, um, fast growing platforms like TikTok. And so understanding where the attention is shifting um, is, is part of that key as well. So number one is making sure that your positioning and differentiation, what you have to say um, is, is different. And, and, you know, I guess avoid what we call the sea of sameness. You don't really want to sound like everyone else. If everyone zigs, you should be zagging. And that's not for the case of just being controversial or trying to be different for the sake of it. It's more about saying, look, what do I honestly believe um, in whether what it is I have to say, um, what it is that I see in the market, what I see from a leadership perspective, and then how do I share that with everyone else? And then where's the best place to share that as well? So I think the distribution after that um, on where that needs to be shared, you mentioned LinkedIn, which is obviously still massive. Um, but that, that's really where I would, uh, I would start for most leaders. Ken, you bring up a really interesting point around the sea of sameness. And I want to ask for how, your expertise on how to take that knowledge and that expertise that you do with companies today to avoid the sea of sameness and translate that into an inside an organization. So someone listening to this as a manager, a director, a VP, even a C-level executive, how do they think about and how do they avoid the sea of sameness within their organization? I guess if you think about it this way, um, <clears throat> a lot of big companies and particularly around C-suites and executives, they all sound the same as well. <clears throat> they all say the same things. They're, they use the same cliches. I think it's almost about sort of being different and not for the sake of, again, like I said before, about being polarizing or different. I mean, you're dealing with um, an internal team here. And um, I think the difference between what we teach in marketing versus what you would do internally is that in marketing, we say you attract, you know, your proverbial Kevin Kelly's 1000 true fans, you know, just, you know, own your level of weirdness, own your level of uniqueness, <clears throat> pardon me, um, be different. And, and you will, you will attract the people who you will attract and you will propel the people who you, you know, don't want to propel. I mean, in that case, I think what, um, what we struggle with internally is that you don't, you don't necessarily have that luxury. You need hundred percent buy-in ideally for your uh, internal team members. Um, so I think there is, um, a certain chasm when it comes to there where you shouldn't necessarily get a little bit too weird because then, you know, you'll start to, you know, you'll start to have fragmentation within the company. Um, but what's also important is to be actually authentic and to be real um, mm -hmm. to the point where it's like address the elephant in the room, um, talk about what's obvious to your people, avoid the proverbial cliches, um, particularly around communications, because most of the time as a leader, you're probably doing communication on a mass scale. You're not doing the one to ones nearly as much. So I think your ability to be able to address people, I think we only need to look at sort of the very, uh, I guess, inspirational leaders. I mean, the really classic ones are sort of your, your Mandela's and your, you know, your Martin Luther King's and those sort of guys where they're, how they're able to actually rally people along. And that's also to understand that, you know, you are here to actually help people um, understand what the mission is yeah. and, and to get people in emotionally tethered to the mission and to understand the vision and the direction you want to take it and have people support you in that campaign. Love it. And being different, being authentic, and avoiding cliches are three great tips on how to go about doing that. All right. Now let's talk about the audience aspect of this. In marketing, when we're looking at companies like you do with your clients, we're looking at what is the demand possible in the market? What are the challenges that these other people that you want to attract are facing so you can talk about that in a meaningful way and hopefully position yourself as a potential solution? Now, inside a company, 
your audience and the other leaders within the organization and the other people within the organization. So I'm curious, how should leaders think about their audience when we look at this internally versus in an external environment? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I think you're, they're, two, they're two very different audiences if you think of it in a lot of ways, but they're also very similar. They're, they're different because one is essentially helping you get to where you want to, which is the, the mission-based aspect of the business. Um, and I think when your company gets to a certain size, I mean, even for a company as you know, relatively small like ours, you know, you can't do it alone. If you really want to grow and scale this business, you're going to need, you know, uh, other talented people who can help you with that. Um, I like to think of it as, you know, some of the best people that you can have on board are your entrepreneurs. Um, they may not have the risk or the appetite to be able to go out and do that themselves, but they're more than happy to have, you know, the safety net of a steady paying job, but be able to exercise sort of that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, in the way that they they do things within your company, right? Um, now, externally, I think what's important is to understand that you know most people do that to build again, you know, still mission based. That's where the similarity is. And if people are emotionally tethered to what it is that your company does, what your service or your product offers, um, then it's much easier to get buy in to convert people into paying customers or clients. To do that, you have to communicate very clearly, and that goes back to your positioning and your differentiation there. But the, the great thing about that is just making sure that you sort of drill down um, and get very specific and have something unique to say, as opposed to, again, that sea of sameness. That, and that is a really interesting point. The positioning differentiation, um, I've drawn a parallel here and just listening to you t talk about the importance of this. And that is, that is universally applicable. Whether you're thinking about how to um, market yourself internally inside your organization, it's all through positioning and differentiation. What is the reason that someone should consider you for a future leadership position versus, you know, whoever else might be in the pool or whoever else may, might be possible? Don't need to get into like, you know, competition here, but how can you best position yourself to get whatever the next role is that you want to get, right? And that's a big part of the marketing piece. So that, um, that positioning and differentiation. The other thing you said there, which was really interesting, was getting people emotionally tethered. Um, you were talking about it in the context of the brand, but if your leadership is your brand, and if people are emotionally tethered to you as a leader, that seems like it'd be an incredibly powerful, um, you know, kind of just skill to develop or even uh, element of your leadership to enhance and develop to make sure that your marketing internally would be just as powerful. Curious for your thoughts on those observations. Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, people think of people as logical creatures, mm -hmm. you know, power of deduction, you know, whatever. I mean, we have so many mental models and blind spots and fallacies that we all are, you know, making emotional decisions most of the time. And that's why emotion is such a, a strong thing. You know, I, I, you know, like I said, emotional EQ, emotional intelligence is, should be massive in business. I, I think it's the number one soft skill when it comes to yeah. um, leaders. If, if your emotional intelligence is not strong, right, you are, you've got a massive blind spot in your leadership as well. So to yeah. understand exactly getting a finger on the pulse as to what is happening in the business and how people feel and what the culture is like and what the vibe is like, for lack of better words, um, that is actually key for a successful business. And I actually think some of the best businesses out there are businesses that have strong continuity with their people meaning low churn, low turnover, um, consistency, having the same great talent over and over again. And you might not have, I mean, it's the same with my business. It's the same when I worked in hotels. It was the same in you know other organizations that I've heard from other business owners is that you may not have the best team, like not every single person is an A grade, five star, you know, all star, but you're going to need a bit of both. You need your role players, you need your bench players, you sort of need your all stars there because it's that combination that works really, really well. And it's to get the best out of all these guys and to hang on to them for as long as you can. And that's not handcuffing them and, you know, threatening them to, to leave. But I think it's mainly about harnessing the power and actually allowing them. And I think, you know, it's like that classic adage people say that, you know, people don't quit companies, they quit their yeah. bosses, right? So it's the same thing. It's like, think about the fact that how do you look after your staff? How do you make them feel involved? How do you create a safe environment? Because if you can do that, you're already halfway there to actually creating a really successful business. Um, we've had no churn in our team members at all. And I think I attribute a lot of that scaling growth and success to the business of the fact that we've been able to have the same team from day one. Um, so I think I, I can't stress that enough. I think that's super important. And that goes back to sort of the mission 
the, the, the values, the positioning, the differentiation, you know, make these guys feel like they're part of something bigger um, and they're working with you towards that as opposed to you being sort of that, that leader at the top who might be getting the bonus, they might be getting paid really handsomely and these guys are slugging out, you know, down in the front lines and it's, it's mainly about that. That's phenomenal. No turnover in the, the, you know, 18 plus months. You've been rocking and rolling, building the team, scaling to the size during the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. all that there. And I think it's a great testament to exactly what we're talking about, which is you have to market your leadership all the time internally too, because they're only as bought in as the culture uh, lives. As soon as your culture changes, the game changes. And then there's usually a pretty strong question of whether or not I still fit here. Right. So just the example you shared earlier of running that training on, um, you know, productivity and email management and task prioritization and that thing is is an example of marketing your leadership. You're different than other places and other leaders this team has ever worked for before because nobody would invest in them like that, especially not the CEO of the company sitting down to take them through some exercises and things to think about. So I think that's actually a wonderful example of just how to be different, um, knowing that the vast majority of the working world does not experience that kind of leadership. Absolutely. I think if there was um, anything that's probably changed the way that I saw management or just leadership was actually um, reading Dale Carnegie's book on how to win friends and influence people. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people have read it. It is amazing, but it can be applied across many, many different things. And yep. if there was going to be one takeaway out of that, it was mainly just to lead in with compliments, shower them with compliments before you actually um, give constructive criticism. And, and I think um, a lot of business owners can be quite emotionally charged themselves. You know, they don't necessarily have that EQ level for, for that self-awareness. Um, and they sort of lead in with the negativity first. And that, that generally tends to foster a very, very negative culture instead of to say, look, I get it. You know, things messed up. Maybe this thing went wrong. You know, essentially take the ammunition out of the gun so they don't really have any objections. You've set it all for them. And so I, I find when doing that, um, that helps with, you know, people growing, that helps with people allowing that they feel like they have a self safe environment to be able to develop. And mm -hmm. they understand that mistakes do happen and people's intentions, I think ultimately they, they believe that they're always doing the right thing, they're doing their best. Um, and it's just making sure that that matches and it aligns with what your expectations are and then giving them the ability to continue to develop instead of feeling like, oh, I'm in fear of making a mistake and then ultimately mm -hmm. leading towards more issues. But wonderful. And, and the Winning Friends Influencing People, one of the cornerstone books of all time. Just incredible. If you haven't read it, got to get it, period. Um, one last question about the internal or actually the leadership, but focusing a little bit more externally. So there's a brand element that we've been talking about with leaders internally to build. And then there's a brand element for leaders to think about externally, whether whatever your platform of choice is in our world, usually it's LinkedIn and whatnot. So taking that, you know, sea of sameness approach and just avoiding that, um, would that be the number one place for someone to start if they were thinking about how to more effectively build their brand on LinkedIn? And perhaps if they hadn't been terribly active on the social side in a while, because they've been consumed with all the work that goes on internally every day. I think... Where most people would or should start, actually, um, should I say, yeah, is to think of, you know, going back to the whole subject matter expert versus subject matter contributor. So when you start to think of that, you know, I know a lot of people, despite the fact they're in leadership positions, I myself as well, feel like, hey, I'm not, you know, the top, I'm not the Elon Musk's or the Jeff Bezos of my industry or my world. So being a contributor actually helps with that because it's like you're not, you don't have to be the best of the best to be able to create content. But I think what works, what we see perform extremely well with content is just having consistency of publishing content, authoring mm -hmm. all the time. And the reason for that is because it's, you know, the adage I use is you compare it with investments. You know, you can either speculate and go for the really, I guess, you know, speculative stocks and hope that maybe one of them takes you to the moon. Um, but unfortunately, most times, I'd say 99% of the time, you probably end up with a pretty dud stock, right? Yeah. Yep. The same applies for content and the same applies for marketing. You're not trying to manufacture, you know, that, that one viral piece of content. It's actually the consistency. So, you know, if you think about the way you invest, you, you know, the safe way and the steady way to do that is to put that into an index fund. You know, you're sort of diversified and you've got, you know, stakes in lots and lots of different businesses. The same with content. You sort of go in there and you create, you know, say 100 pieces of content. 80 of them will do, you know, as expected. They'll do pretty, you know, middle line. And then you'll have... 18% of it will do horribly, like it'll just not work, but then there'll be 2% that take you to the moon. That's sort of the viral mm -hmm. stuff. Now, you just don't know which one it is, 
And so that's right. why you've got to do the reps you got to do because you don't know which one is the home run. So the idea is that you have to be really consistent with this process and be really prolific about your content creation in order to grow your brand on platforms like LinkedIn. Because again, that sea of sameness, there's just so much, you know, part of my French, but there's so much shit out in the market that I actually think that you have to actually consistently do this over time. Because when people actually decide to want to work with you or they want to join your organization or maybe they want to engage in your products or services, the thing that they think about is not just that single piece of content, but it's that sum of all stuff that you've published and created over a long period of time. It's that sort of priming that indoctrination that you do. It's the same for your employees. You can't just do one pep rally, one big motivational speak once a year, state of the union, and then expect that your employees are just going to buy into that. I think you have to do this messaging consistently in order for people to get that drilled into their heads and understand what it is that you do. And also because, you know, people may not be tuned into at certain stages, you know, like it's, it's whenever it's an attention game, like that's the currency of, you know, marketing in general or branding. You've got to consistently do that because you just don't know when people um, will click with that. You don't know, maybe you'll say things a little bit differently and people just resonate with that better, even though it's the same thing. So again, it's just testing, experimenting, trying lots of things, um, but being consistent is going to be the best place to start and not worry too much about perfection. Try not to go, oh, that was a terrible video and judge yourself. I think it's, um, you know, we, we uh, you know, as, as self-conscious human beings, we always sort of focus on that, but it's really just about, you know, hey, let's not judge it. I mean, that's part of the reason why I've hired someone internally. I'm like, if this person can take care of it and I don't have to look at myself, I'm cool because that just means I can continue <laughs> to be prolific about it as well. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, the consistency is king, right? It, that's what it's about. And, and that actually is a great thread between what we were talking about internally doing and externally as well. So if you're doing some posting today, great. If, you know, take a look at this from the angle, like Ken was talking about, the sea of sameness. How much of what you're saying is really 100% duplicative of exactly what's already out there? And where are the points that you can differentiate? How can you add value to the audience that's out there over a long period of time? You don't have to have all the answers now. You just have to commit to being consistent. And I'm with you, Ken, 100%. So I started my first consulting firm in January 1st of 2015. That was when I started producing. Um, I had not been producing content, uh, you know, socially a, a bit in my field at the time for several years prior as an individual contributor, manager, director, VP, because I wanted to share just like my experiences. And hopefully I could help other people avoid some of the pitfalls that I went through when, you know, customer success as a field was very, very new. And then when I um, left my last job and I started my consulting firm, that was like the cornerstone of everything was going to be this weekly newsletter that I posted a blog post every week for four or five years just about customer success. And it was all about cutting through the noise and cutting through the clutter. And it did help build a brand tremendously, but I didn't have any short-term goals. I knew this was a long-term play. And that's the same reason why this podcast exists. This is a long-term play. I'm not worried about one episode here, one episode there. I'm worried about creating a longevity of years and years and years and years of podcast to you know give and share tremendous advice and expertise, just like you're doing with us. Um, and that's what I'm in it because leadership is a long-term game. So yep. your points are well taken and I can just attest to how important that is and how, how 100% spot on everything is because I've lived it myself. Yeah, I, I have to echo that because I can't stress enough about the importance of playing the long game, um, particularly in marketing. Um, and we see it a lot um, in just you know general branding um, exercises is that people measure success on a short-term basis. And I don't know where this arbitrary short-term time frame comes from. I think it just comes from a lack of patience. But I think um, a lot of people, you know, at least in marketing, are assessing the, uh, the validity or the success of their marketing campaigns or their, um, their efforts based on a month-to-month -month or even sometimes on a week-to-week -week scale, right? And, um, you know, I would say you don't ask for marriage on the first date. So if you're building a relationship with your audience, why are you measuring this based on, you're not getting married after a month, you're not getting married after even maybe yeah. potentially say six months. So the idea is that you need to actually build a relationship and build that know, like, and trust over a long period of time, because that consistency is what ultimately ends up yielding you the returns. I mean, we're really bullish on, you know, podcasts and even like YouTube channel growth as a way of sort of um, building your brand. And what we find is that in the first six, even 12 months, sometimes for clients, depending on what your niche and your vertical is, um, you may not see the results, but what ends up happening is you hit a tipping point at some stage and you, and you get all that return on investment um, after month 12, move into month 18 and month 24. And so if you gave up in the first few months, then you've already mm -hmm. lost that opportunity. And I think um, 
there's a real problem, I guess, at the moment in the market, or at least um, when it comes to marketing in general, is that everyone's out there trying to teach you the quick hacks, the silver bullet, yeah. right? And I'm the like, three things you must have. <laughs> that's right. And it's and it's all about now I just see things I'm like, slow and steady wins the race, you know, like a classic tortoise and the hare race, right? People slack, they go feast and famine, feast and famine, but I'm just like slow and steady because that's going to get you there eventually. I'd rather get rich and I'd rather do really well, um, guaranteed, slowly, than to maybe get rich and filthy um, rich and, and get really successful um, based on maybe something that's done faster on, on a silver bullet or a, a quick hack as well. So I think that's yeah. the main thing for people to take away. Awesome. Just leadership is a long-term game. Marketing is a long-term game and marketing your leadership is a long-term game. You heard it right there from a marketing expert, a leadership expert. Can thank you so much for sharing your insights, expertise, advice with us across so many different fronts. We've had a blast. Where can people get in touch with you if they want to know more about the work that you do with companies just like theirs? Yeah, so we, we primarily work with B2B service-based companies, um, particularly around SaaS. Um, I think if anyone wants to get in touch, just to understand maybe what sort of marketing strategy that could help them. Um, and also, we've also got a lot of um, actually B2B marketing leaders as well who sort of want to attract top talent in their organization as well. And there's sort of different type of marketing there. Um, <clears throat> they can reach out to me. My email is can, so it's spelled K-A-N at socialwave.com.au. Um, otherwise, they can jump on our website, which is socialwave.com.au, um, book in a time, free initial consultation just to understand what their situation is and see whether or not we're a good fit. And even though you're based in Australia, you serve clients worldwide, right? Yes, exactly. Wonderful. Love it. All right, Can. Well, it has been a blast. And if you guys have additional questions for Can or other topics on marketing your leadership you love to hear, just hit reply on any of the messages that I send out and I will get Can back on the show because I think there's a lot more that we could unpack on the marketing side, on the leadership side, and would love to see you back in the future. Cool. Thanks, Nils. All right. Thanks, Can. Take care. Have a good one. Cheers. 